Happy Easter and welcome to Community Gospel Chapel. My name is Micah, I'm the pastor here, and I just want to welcome you to our online worship experience today. If you're new with us, we're so glad you're here. Please check out our welcome card at communitygospelchapel.com slash welcome. And you'll find out more information there about who we are as a church. And we'd love to connect with you and get to know you a little bit. Also today, if you want to join with us in giving, you can do that at communitygospelchapel.com slash giving. All the information is there for you. So happy Easter. We're so glad you're joining in with us wherever you are. I just want to pray for you, and then we're going to jump into the message today. Jesus, I just want to thank you for today. I thank you for who you are. I thank you for Easter and that we can just celebrate your resurrection. Thank you that you have died for each one of us and that you rose again to bring us new life. We could be raised with you. I pray a blessing over each person as they're tuning in today, as they're joining in with us online, as we celebrate your resurrection together. Thank you that there is nothing that can stop you not even the grave, not even death. And so we just celebrate you today. Holy Spirit, thank you that you're present with each person in their home, wherever they are watching from right now. I pray a blessing over them in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to jump here into the message in just a moment. I've got a special Easter message for you, and I hope you'll be blessed and encouraged with it. Happy Easter again. You know, Easter is such an incredible celebration. It's, we, we just went through Good Friday, and I hope you t tuned in for the Good Friday service. And I hope that was an encouragement to you. But Easter is really what it's all about. In fact, the, the early church changed their day of worship and celebration to Sunday to remember and and they called it the Lord's Day to remember and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. This incredible event that happened. And still to this day, we are celebrating Easter. You know, I was so hoping that we would be able to celebrate at least in a small group together in person today. And unfortunately, that's just not possible at this point. But, but I'm so glad that we can join together and that, that each of our homes actually becomes a place of celebration as we turn our attention to Jesus, as we remember him, as we celebrate him. And today I want to look at uh, this incredible story of Jesus' resurrection. We're going to pick it up in John chapter 19, and we're going to read verses 38 to 42. This is what it says. It says, After this, Joseph from the city of Ramah, or Arimathea, who was a secret disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jewish authorities, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus. So Pilate granted him permission to remove the body from the cross. Now Nicodemus, who had once come to Jesus privately at night, accompanied Joseph, and together they carried a significant amount of myrrh and aloes to the cross. When they took Jesus, Then they took Jesus' body and wrapped it in strips of linen with the embalming spices according to the Jewish burial customs. Near the place where Jesus was crucified was a garden, and in the garden there was a new tomb where no one had yet been laid to rest. And because Shabbat was approaching and the tomb was nearby, that's where they laid the body of Jesus. Then we're going to read John chapter 20. It says, Very early Sunday morning before sunrise, Mary Magdalene made her way to the tomb, 
And when she arrived, she discovered that the stone that sealed the entrance to the tomb was moved away. So she went running as fast as she could to go tell Peter and the other disciples. And the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. She told them, they've taken the Lord's body from the tomb and we don't know where he is. And then Peter and the other disciples jumped up and ran to the tomb to go see for themselves. They started out together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He didn't enter the tomb, but peeked in and saw only the linen cloths. Then Peter came behind him and went right into the tomb. He too noticed the linen cloths lying there. But the burial cloth that had been on Jesus' head had been rolled up and placed separately from the other cloths. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first went in. And after one look, he believed. For until then, they hadn't understood the scripture that prophesied that he was destined to rise from the dead. Puzzled, Peter and the other disciple then left and went back to their homes. Mary arrived back at the tomb, broken and sobbing. She stooped to peer inside, and through her tears she saw two angels in dazzling white robes sitting where Jesus' body had been laid, one at the head and one at the feet. Dear woman, why are you crying, they asked. Mary answered, they have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've laid him. Then she turned around to leave. There was Jesus standing in front of her, but she didn't realize that it was him. He said to her, dear woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? And Mary answered, thinking he was only the gardener. Sir, if you have taken his body somewhere else, tell me and I will go. And Mary, Jesus interrupted her. Turning to face him, she said, Rabboni, which is Aramaic for my teacher. And Jesus cautioned her, Mary, don't hold on to me now, for I haven't yet ascended to God my Father. And he's not only my Father and God, but now he's your Father and your God. Now go to my brothers and tell them what I've told you, that I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. Then Mary Magdalene left to inform the disciples of her encounter with Jesus. I have seen the Lord, she told them. And she gave them his message. You know, I want to focus for a minute on a statement from Luke, from this very same story. It's from Luke 24, verse 5. And it's just after the women come to the, to the tomb and they see the, the angels. It's in verse 5, and it says, The men in white said to them, Why would you look for the living one in a tomb? He is not here, for he is, for he has risen. And today as we celebrate Easter, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. I think this, this statement is so relevant for us. Why would we look for the living one in the tomb? Why is it that we look for Jesus in places that are not living? Why is it that, that in our lives we look for him in the, the dry and dead places? The places with no life. You see, in faith, without faith, that makes sense. We would look for Jesus where we last saw him. But when we take into account faith, we hear the message like the angels that says, why would you look for the living one in a tomb among the dead? You see, while Jesus was buried in a garden, in a tomb. There's something so much more profound that happens. And it's, it's actually a reflection of the nature of God. You see, Easter wasn't just an isolated event that, happens 2000, that happened 2,000 years ago that we're to just remember. But it is actually the very reflection of the nature and character of God. Jesus turns a rich man's tomb into a place of celebration. He takes a place of grieving and mourning and he turns it into a place of rejoicing. You see, the promise in this is that it's not just a one-time event, but this is what Jesus does in our lives daily. He doesn't just come into our life and leave it the same. He brings 
transformation because that's his nature. He takes graves and turns them into gardens, into places of celebration, into places of life. We see this at creation. In Genesis chapter 1, it says the earth was without form and it was void. It was empty. And God comes and he speaks and he creates a garden. And he creates man and woman to live in this garden and to take care of it. And if you know the story, the first man and woman chose to reject the voice of God, to walk away, turn away from him. And we see the suffering and the, the pain that that caused. The garden turned to a grave, a place of death, something that was meant for life becoming something that caused death in them because of their choice. And still, Jesus comes to set us free. We made the choice at the beginning to walk away from the life, from the goodness of God, from all of His promises, and to experience hardship and pain and sin and destruction and sickness, all of those things. And yet Jesus comes to set us free from every single one of those. He doesn't come into our lives just to leave them the same. He comes in to turn graves into gardens. Not just to take us back to, to creation, to, to the Garden of Eden, but to something so much bigger, so much better. You see this in the life of Jesus. The law would command him not to ever come near somebody who was sick or diseased. And yet when he would interact with them, they would be the one that would be impacted, not him. He didn't become unholy by interacting with unholy things. Instead, he redeemed them, he healed them, he restored them. Why would we look for the one who is life in a place of death, in a place of emptiness and, and destruction? Why would, we ex why would we contort his image and say, well, well, I have Jesus, but he doesn't affect the way I live? You see, in an act of utter brutality, of destruction and pain, of Jesus being beaten and tortured and hung on a cross. He brought life and freedom and redemption for us. He turns that act of destruction. It actually says that for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. He went through Good Friday. He went through this day of pain and torment and torture, the worst possible excruciating pain and torture a person could endure. And he did it for you so that he could turn, he couldn't just, so not just so that 2,000 years ago he would turn a grave into a garden, but that he could do it in your life. That he could turn your graves, your dead places, your dry places into gardens, into flourishing lives filled with love and joy and peace. 2,000 years later, and we are still celebrating, we are still experiencing the transformation of graves into gardens because he endured the cross, because he was laid in a grave, and because on the third day he rose again in victory. You see, one of the sacraments that, that we believe in as followers of Jesus, is the sacrament of baptism. And Paul says that, that baptism is aligning ourselves with the death and resurrection of Jesus. And in his death we are forgiven, and that in his resurrection we are raised to new life in him. A radical transformation from death to life. That Jesus suffered on our behalf so that we could tie ourselves to him and experience that incredible life. And so I want to encourage you today, that when you look at your life, the things that, that you might look at and say, this is, this is dead, this is dry. The things the enemy meant for evil. Jesus turns around in a victory declaration. You know, on Friday, the Good Friday, what we celebrate is Good Friday. 
The enemy thought he had won. He hung the Savior of the world on a cross with nails in his hands and his feet, with spear in his side, beaten and bruised until you, he was unrecognizable. And yet, as we read last week, when Jesus rose, he led a victory procession of all the rulers and principalities and spiritual authorities. He humiliated them. See, and so in the same way that the enemy meant for Friday, Good Friday, to be a day of destruction, of death, of the end of the Savior. And Jesus radically transformed it through his resurrection on the third day, on the Sunday. The things that the enemy has meant for death in your life, the things he has meant for destruction, maybe it's something that's happened to you in the past. God is redeeming those. He is bringing about something so incredible in your life. So often we can make ourselves victims to our situation. Well, this happened to me and so therefore I am this way. Or you'll never understand what that person did to me or how that person treated me or how they made me feel. You'll never understand what my parents said to me. You'll never understand what I've been through. And so often we can make ourselves a victim to the situation. What the enemy meant for destruction and evil and brokenness in your life, Jesus is transforming into something beautiful. The thing that the enemy meant to put you in the grave, Jesus is transforming into a beautiful garden in your life. The brokenness, the hurt, the pain, the things that you think he can't fix, he can't solve, he can't touch, he is taking from the grave to the garden. Because that is what he does. That is the nature of God. And when you invite him into your life, when you partner your life with his, as you align yourself with his death and resurrection and you put everything else aside and that becomes primary in your life, he will take those things those barren places, those painful places, those damaged places, and he will transform them. We have this incredible story in John chapter 4. This is the beginning of John. We just read in the end of John. And you can see how this theme carries on through the life of Jesus, how it, in his death and resurrection, his promises are fulfilled. And in John chapter 4, Jesus goes to a well outside a Samaritan village and, and it's the wrong time for gathering water. And this woman is there and he stops and he asks her for a drink. And she's confused because a Jew would never be speaking to a Samaritan. And so she's asking him, you know, why would you be asking me for water? After all, you're Jewish, I'm Samaritan. Doesn't that make it unclean? And I love this. In, in John chapter 4, verse 10, it says, Jesus replied, If you only knew who I am and the gift that God wants to give you, you'd ask me for a drink and I would give you living water. And she's so confused. She's thinking about the physical. She's like, well, you don't have any way to, to draw the water. And later we find out that this woman was not a woman of high reputation in the community. That there were areas of her life, of her marriage that were broken, that were shameful, that, that were places of barrenness, of death in her life. But Jesus says this in verse 13. It says, Jesus answered, If you drink from Jacob's well, you'll be thirsty again. And again, but if anyone drinks the living water I give them, they will never thirst again and will be forever satisfied. For when you drink the water I give you, it becomes a gushing fountain of the Holy Spirit springing up and flooding you with endless life. You see, back to what the angels said at the tomb is that when we meet the living one, they said, don't look for, why would you look for the living one among the dead? Because when you meet the living one, he brings living water. 
And it comes bursting forth within you. The places that were dead, the places that caused pain, the places of hurt become gushing, living water. Gushing wells of the Holy Spirit in your life, in your heart. Flooding you with endless life. As you meet the one who is life, it brings about rivers of living water. This is so incredible, this idea of a gushing fountain. It's not a trickling stream or a stagnant pond. But it is, it is a continual source where we stay connected to at all times. So often the religious mindset is that we come and we get filled up and then we go out. And we do what God has asked us to do. But here Jesus is actually saying that, he, that, that when he gives us to drink, it actually births gushing fountains of the Holy Spirit. Flooding us with endless life. Bubbling up in living waters within us. It's a continual flow. It doesn't stop. And while we leak as humans, as we leak and, and love on people, there is no end to, to the source of this living water. The places that were meant for death, that the enemy meant for evil, become places of overwhelming joy. They become transformation in my life. They become hope and redemption in my life because I have rivers of living water that spring up within me. It's not by my strength that I'm transformed. I don't have the power to make that change, to transform somebody else, to, to change my own situation. But it is as I come to Jesus, as He gives me this living water, that those dry, empty, barren places become life, become rivers of living water springing up within me. You see, I live constantly connected to Jesus with a constant flow of living water so that I would never be thirsty. In the life of a believer, there should never be a desert season. Why? Because I have rivers of living water springing up within me. But so often what we do is we experience the forgiveness of Jesus. We experience Good Friday, but we stop on Saturday. We never step into the resurrection of Sunday. There's this story I keep coming back to in Matthew 27. And it says that when Jesus died, Matthew 27, 51, it says at that moment the veil of the Holy of Holies was torn in two from the top to the bottom. The earth shook violently, rocks were split apart, and graves were opened. Then many of the holy ones who had died were brought back to life and came out of their graves. And after Jesus' resurrection, they were plainly seen by many people walking in Jerusalem. Now this is an incredible verse, but I want to highlight something here quickly. Because I think it reflects what many of us do, is we experience the power of Jesus' death on Good Friday. We experience his forgiveness, but we remain in the grave. Here it says they remain in the grave until after Jesus' resurrection. They were seen after his resurrection. Here it says that on Friday, these holy ones were brought back to life. But it wasn't until after Jesus' resurrection that they were seen in Jerusalem. And I wonder, how often as believers do we live like that? We experience the forgiveness of Jesus on Good Friday. But then we live our lives on Saturday. And we never enter into the resurrection of Sunday. We never step out of the grave. We never step into the garden. We never step into the redemption. Because instead, we stay in the graveyard. You know, many of us, what we'll do is, is we'll stay in that place of hurt. We'll become a victim to something that has happened to us in the past. This thing that the enemy did, this brokenness, this pain, 
what somebody said to us. We'll run through it in our minds. We'll go over it over, over and over again. What so many of us will do is we will try and renovate the graveyard. We know Jesus' promises for gardens, for refreshing, for redemption, for transformation. And so we're like, well, we're going to stay in this graveyard. I'm going to paint the walls. I'm going to hang some plastic flowers. And we think, oh, that's good enough. But what Jesus wants to do is he wants to take those places of pain in your life, those places of destruction and hurt, the things the enemy meant for evil, and he wants to redeem them and transform them. He wants to take those places that are bare in those graves and turn them into gardens, places of fruitfulness, places of increase in your life. So often we become comfortable in the grave because we've painted the walls and hung the flowers and, and put up pictures, we become comfortable there. And then the mes message of Jesus' redemption is actually offensive to us. Because we say, well, why would you deliver me from this place that I've constructed? This is my safe place. Jesus doesn't want to mess up my safety, does he? He doesn't want to mess up my comfort, does he? He should just leave me alone in this place that I've created for myself. But he wants to take us from that place, that barren place, that painful place. And he wants to bring us into a place of fulfillment, a garden. So often we don't recognize Jesus standing in front of us, inviting us into something more. Like Mary, maybe we're, we're weeping on the ground in the garden because of what's happened to us, because of something, some, some brokenness, some pain, some hurt, some addiction. We think Jesus is the gardener there to cultivate the plastic flowers, to, to repaint the walls of our grave. But he doesn't want to just, to re he doesn't just want to renovate the grave, he wants to take us from the grave to the garden. He wants to take us from the place of destruction and desolation to the place of hope. That is what He wants to do in your life. And that is why we celebrate Easter. That is why today we celebrate the resurrection because it's Jesus transforming death to life. Jesus transforming what the enemy meant to destroy mankind thinking he had won over the Savior to the life-giving power of the resurrection. The invitation for you and I to be part of his family. You see, we often try and imitate the garden in the grave without allowing the one who brings transformation to do what he does best, what's in his nature. Maybe today that grave is a broken relationship. Maybe it's a, a marriage that feels like it's falling apart. Maybe it's children who are walking away from you or from God or, or maybe you haven't had contact with them. Maybe it's hurts from your parents. Maybe it's hurts from somebody else. Maybe it's something from your past. Maybe it's an addiction. Whatever that place of barrenness is Jesus wants to transform. He wants to renew it and refresh it. He wants to not just see you die to your old self, but He wants to raise you into the newness of life. So that you could experience this reality that He talks about in John 4, that rivers of living water would bubble up inside of you. There's no end to that. There's no cutoff point. When we celebrate communion, when we celebrate baptism, it's to take us and remind us of what Jesus has done. That we have continual access to these rivers of living water. When we feel like we're at the end of our patience, guess what? I have rivers of living water welling up inside of me, growing in patience. When I feel like I'm out of love, I have the living, gushing fountain of the Holy Spirit filling me up with love to love people more. And that's exactly what he has for you. He's gonna, he wants to take those dead and barren places and transform them in your life. And all it takes is for you to let him.
like Mary to declare, Jesus, you are my teacher. Jesus, I lay everything down at your feet. You see, that is why we celebrate Easter. That is why we make a big deal. Because it is a declaration of the nature of God, and therefore it is a prophecy of what he wants to do in your life. He wants to take us from death to life. Defeating and humiliating the enemy in the process. So I want to close by praying for you. I just want to invite you today to just receive. This isn't about something you have to do. This isn't about you improving yourself or just getting over it or, or saying it didn't happen. This is about giving it to Jesus and saying, Jesus, I want you to take these dead places, these barren places, these places where I thought that I would find you. I want to discover you and I want you to, I want you to transform them. I give them over to you. So Jesus, I thank you for every single person who's watching this. I thank you that you are taking them from death to life as they welcome and invite you into their lives. Right now, Jesus, we just agree with your nature as, as the one who transforms, as our Redeemer. And we hand over to you all the things that we've been holding on to the dead places that we've tried to renovate, we just hand them over to you and we say, Jesus, you do what you do best. We ask that you would take them right now in each person's life. You would break off death in Jesus' name. And in this place, you would we just release life. I pray right now specifically for anyone who has been struggling with thoughts of death. And we just release, we break that off right now in Jesus' name. We rebuke that spirit and we release life. We rede release redemption. We pray for those who feel hopeless. We release hope in Jesus' name because you are the one who brings hope. So Holy Spirit, I ask that you would touch them right now and infuse them with a fresh hope today. That they would experience the reality of the Easter story in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you guys. Happy Easter. And let's let Jesus do what he does best.